welcome to episode three of Morning Thoughts, the podcast with Philip Etzel about art and culture and the creative process. Um, guys, you did it. You freaking did it. Last week we had, I think like over, I don't know, close to like 200 plays on, on YouTube and on Spotify, which is huge. But guys, I failed. I failed big time. I did not post a podcast last week and I'd like to explain a little bit why. So I recorded a podcast and every time I've recorded a podcast so far, I've recorded it twice because the second time it just gets a lot better. But last time I recorded a podcast and it was like 52 minutes long, 54 minutes long, something like that. It was the longest podcast I've recorded so far and it was pretty good, but it kind of felt like it didn't have really the 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 quality that I wanted in terms of like content and the meat of good discussion, et cetera, et cetera. And so I don't know, I just felt a little self-conscious about posting it and maybe I shouldn't have, but I I did anyway, and then I, maybe I shouldn't have felt self-conscious, I mean, but I didn't post it, and uh, I felt kind of like a loser because of it, but I will say I at least posted a podcast because I recorded a podcast last week with my friends Matt McCloskey and Michael Vakalov, I think that's how you say his last name, uh, called The Shores of Ignorance. Uh, They had me on their podcast, and we talked about my career transitioning from a touring musician to a full-time photographer, sort of uh, fear and anxieties that come alongside those career transitions, as well as um, just creativity and, and fear in general. And uh, we just got pretty open and honest and it was a, it was a really awesome conversation and a really great podcast. Shout out to those guys. If you want to listen to it, Go to soundcloud.com slash shores of ignorance or just uh, search shores of ignorance on SoundCloud. I think it's now on iTunes as well. So you can check that out. That was really cool. But I'm excited about this podcast. I think it's going to be one of the best, actually the best of the three so far. We're getting better each week, hopefully. Um, we're talking about a little bit of the recap of last week. I'm going to fill you in on some some cool stuff that happened last week and some some good stuff that I heard and some thoughts that I had. Um, And then we're also going to discuss some morning thoughts and some questions, including licensing. I'm actually going to, guys, I'm going to make a chart for you here. If you're watching on YouTube, you're going to get to see the chart. Um, So I recommend that. Uh, And then uh, we'll talk about having an agent and also retouching and editing on the iPad. I wrote an article about that not too long ago. And that for some reason does, I get a lot of traffic on that article on my website. I think a lot of people are kind of trying to figure out new solutions. It's probably time for a lot of people that have been using Macs for a while to upgrade. And, you know, the new MacBook Pros are hella expensive. And a lot of people are just trying to figure out what's the next step. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, it's going to be a good episode, I think. So last week I did that podcast. I also hosted a Sony B Alpha event here in Austin. If you guys came to that, if you're in Austin, um, shout out to you guys for supporting. And hopefully you guys had a great time. It seemed like everyone was really enjoying it. We kind of, I don't want to say we threw it together last minute because we had been planning it for a couple months, but um, 24 hours before the event, we decided to change venues to open up more spots for photographers to come in to have more room and we had a giant warehouse at fair market and had about five sets i think we put together within like a few hours from like one to five o'clock when it opened um and uh it it was really dope the talent was really great the styling was really great shout out to sony and to all the the people involved with that and uh if you came Tag me in the photos because I want to see them. I'm checking the hashtag, but you you have a chance to, I think, win a Sony RX100 Mark V or Mark VI if you hashtag Sony Alpha Meetup from that event. So thanks, everyone, for coming out. Hope you guys dug that. They're doing them all over the country. I don't. I think maybe LA is next. I'm not really sure, but it's really cool for Sony to come to Austin. I wanted them to come here for a while, and um, we we when I announced it, we sold out 
the hundred RSVP spots in like 24 hours, which is really dope. And then, uh, we opened it up to a few more. So, um, that was really cool. Let's talk about the weekend a little bit. Oh, so last night, I don't know if you guys have seen this. I don't know if you guys follow John Mayer on Instagram. He's actually like hilarious. He he could easily be a comedian, but uh, he's also a ridiculous musician. So it's kind of kind of unfair. But um, he started doing this show on Sunday night called Current Mood with John Mayer, where he like it's basically a talk show on Instagram Live where he has guests on there and he has like i think musical guests to perform on there and it's just it's hilarious and it's super like off the cuff and weird like john mayer's personality and uh it's just like really entertaining and it's interesting i i've had that thought for a while like when i was first getting into trying to do youtube I, that was kind of the thought I had was like, how do we treat social media like traditional television? You know, it's funny. I had my friend, uh, Quay in town for the Sony meetup last week. And he was telling me that his two daughters, nine and 10, who are nine, 10, they don't even watch TV. Like they couldn't even tell you who like famous Hollywood celebrities are because they only watch YouTube and that's their television. And that's just wild. I mean, it's not necessarily foreign to me. I mean, I think been thinking about that for a couple of years, but it's still just crazy to me that that the younger generation wouldn't really consume television as we knew it or as I knew it growing up. And so I think treating social media like the entertainment platform that it is, like television, is super smart. And, you know, I... I think that people that treat it like that will win on social media, like John Mayer, who is basically creating a talk show on your mobile phone, Um, like the game show HQ, which is basically created a TV game show on your phone. Or I even think people like um, Tony and Chelsea Northrup, who are big um, camera reviewers, they, they were some of the first people I saw that actually treated YouTube like a film set or a tv set like they actually built a studio and kind of hosted their show as if they were hosting a television show and to me that was just genius i think it's more entertaining to watch it's more familiar to watch and it's just a better format so um highly recommend you checking that out the the only thing about that is like i had thought about doing like live interviews on instagram television or igtv and doing even this podcast on IGTV, like I've gone back and forth about doing it there because I think that a lot of people would, oh, I think more people would watch it because that's obviously where my most of my audience is. The problem is there's some serious limitations with that. First and foremost, um, I'm not sure if you can add Instagram Live to your IGTV like collections yet and or your library or whatever they call it. And that is like a huge fail because if it only lives for 24 hours and you have no way of, um, of like saving that to a database, then you're really creating something that doesn't have any longevity past 24 hours. I think maybe you could save it and post it to YouTube or, or something else, which would probably be a strong idea. But, um, IG really needs to step, step that up. The only other issue is like, even if they, even if you can now post to the stories or you can in the future, I mean, to IGTV, it's just a bad platform. No one cares about it. No one's consuming it. You know, I I was really interested to see what would happen with IGTV when they announced it. It seemed like they were really trying to go after YouTube, but it was just way overkill and and just not something that people were going to consume. But I was interested to see what happened. And it turns out so far that I don't think really anyone is consuming it. So... I don't know. I mean, obviously another limitation is vertical video. You can tell even on John Mayer's show, he's it's it's kind of awkward because he can't fit into the screen alongside a guest. You know, it's kind of it either has to like cut one of them off or it has to be one or the other. And that's just the problem with with the vertical format. So I'm uh I'm I'm really interested to see where he takes that. I think it's gonna be a huge win for him. But um well, hopefully the Instagram will, will start to cater to that and people will get smarter about that. 
Um, oh, well, and that kind of also brings up, I, I heard a really good interview from Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk this weekend. He recently posted it to YouTube. I think it's something about baseball, why baseball is basically going to lose cultural attention. And he made two really, really great points that, that I thought I'd just share kind of along the same lines of, of what John Mayer is doing. So he made the point that like boxing and horse ra- racing in the 1920s or 1930s before there was television were like the biggest sports because they were great um, live sporting events. And then with the advent of the radio, um, like baseball got really huge because not only was baseball a good live event, but it was also uh, an enjoyable event for people to sit around in their home and listen to baseball. Whereas like, it's so much harder to feel the excitement of boxing or feel the excitement of horse racing. If you're sitting around listening to a radio, it just doesn't have the same effect. Whereas like baseball moves, I think at a slow enough pace to where it got really big at radio um, and then, you know, as television got got bigger and became like kind of the dominant platform for entertainment, um, like football and basketball obviously got much, much bigger because they're way more entertaining to watch on television. And obviously like boxing came back into fashion because of that. But what really suffered when television got big was baseball because baseball is the worst to watch on television. I don't like, I don't know. There are probably a lot of baseball fans out there. I'm not a baseball fan. I've never been a baseball fan. However, I love going to baseball games. Baseball games are like at a major league baseball stadium are like a great live experience, but you could not pay me even during the world series. Like I just don't, I just don't care at all about watching baseball on television. It moves so slow. It lasts like 13 hours on television and it's just not interesting to me. So I think there's a small group of diehard baseball fans that like it on television, but this is why baseball's ratings are like slipping because the format is not conducive to their sport. And that's a really interesting idea to think about. And even even with the advent of social media and the internet getting so big, you see esports starting to take off, like Fortnite and you know all these other games that happen on live streaming on Twitch. Like the only reason Ninja is a massive star is because of the internet, you know. And it's interesting to see what live sports will look like as we move more forward into esports, but. Man, that's just such an interesting concept and so crazy that something as dominant as Major League Baseball could get passed up just because it's it's a slower sport and the format doesn't really um, play to its strengths. So I don't know. I thought that was super interesting. Uh, he also made the point that as creators, we should be playing to our strengths in terms of um, content creation. So like let's take introverts versus extroverts. He's, I think he said something to the effect of like extroverts should be creating vlogs and uh, I don't like photos or selfies or something like that. And introverts should be creating podcasts and, and blogs like written um, basically written pieces. And it's really interesting to think about like, there are a lot of people, I see a lot of vloggers I see that are on YouTube that are clearly not suited for YouTube. Like they're just kind of introverted, shy, uncomfortable on camera, and they are still making vlogs. And, you know, you, you kind of wonder like, okay, well maybe if they were, um, they're, they're super creative and super great, you know, super talented artists. And maybe if they were pursuing you know, long form written content or a podcast or even just like behind the scenes video of them creating that that content would just do so much better for them. So I think that's an interesting thing to think about if you're a creator, kind of where do you fall in that spectrum? I'm, I'm, it's weird. I'm an introvert, but I'm like an extroverted introvert. Like I can be extroverted and typically or often I am extroverted when I need to be if the situation calls for it. But generally that like pretty much exhausts me. And uh, I, I would I'm normally like my base setting is an introvert. So, you know, I think I can do video as well as podcast and I like writing. So I don't really know where that puts me, but I think you just kind of have to play to your strengths and 
typically for those, uh, or for me, those have mostly been um, kind of like writing and potentially audio. I don't know. We'll see. Um, oh, uh, so I'm shooting a little uh, motion piece tonight. And, you know, it's always super interesting shooting video at night because there are a lot of X factors, um, mostly just low light environments. And I found this low light profile for Sony's. I, you know, it might work for other cameras. I don't really know the other picture profiles of other cameras, but um, there's a guy on YouTube that does some tutorial stuff and he has a video on like the ultimate Sony low light profile. Uh, I'll, I'll actually put the link to that video in the description uh, just to give you guys, I want to give you guys value. Like I, I want to provide resources for you. So if you are watching this on YouTube, you can check it in the description. If you're watching it on, or if you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, I'll try. I think I can put the link in there. Um, yeah, I think I can. So, um, but it's crazy. I was shooting with it last night in 4k and I got up to like 8,000, 10,000 ISO, which is like pretty crazy. I mean, I know you can get up to like 32,000 ISO, but I wouldn't push that. But even at 10,000 ISO, the footage looks good, like really good. And I was like pretty shocked by it. Um, Cause normally like, you know, if you're trying to shoot S log at night, it's S log two, especially is like a, is a, is meant for bright highlights. And, you know, Typically in video, you're trying to to overexpose that by over two stops, and I've tried to do that in low light, and my footage just ends up looking like garbage. But with this profile, which is based on, I think actually Picture Profile 2, um, the footage just looks insane. So highly recommend that. I will, um, I'll post that in the description below if that's something you're into. Um, oh, I do wanna, I, I do want to talk real quick before I get into morning thoughts about last week's feedback from morning thoughts, or I guess two weeks ago, that morning thoughts. Um, basically, the longer point that I had about becoming a full time photographer. And, you know, my number one question to anyone that's interested in that is should you actually, do you actually want to be a full time photographer? Do you know what that entails? Do you know what that requires from you? And, should you, is that something you actually want to pursue if you're honest with yourself about it? And I had a lot of people that hit me back up and they were like, man, like that was really good, really good info. And somebody emailed me like a really long email and they were like, you know, it made me realize that I actually don't think I'm cut out to be a full-time photographer. I talked a lot last week about the personality that it takes to be freelance. Um, because, you know, you have to go through seasons of ups and downs and seasons where um, you don't have other people to rely on and teams to work with, et cetera. And that can be really tough. And this person emailed me and they were like, man, I just realized like that's not that's not for me. And it's it, I think he seemed kind of like embarrassed about it at first. I think it ultimately it was like relieving to him, but like it should be relieving because it's not embarrassing at all not to be a full-time photographer if you love photography. Like some people work better on teams. Some people would rather have the support of a team and would rather have the consistency of walking into an office where your creative team works and getting, you know, instructions or tasks or whatever it is. And that's like totally fair. I mean, there are plenty of days where I, walk into my office and think like, man, this would be a lot easier. Someone was telling me what to do right now. So uh, hopefully that was relieving to you guys. If you haven't heard that, go and listen to the last podcast because I think that um, resonated with with hopefully quite a few people. All right, so I'm going to get into morning thoughts over the past two weeks. We'll just do um, highlights of a couple of like the things that I really want to talk about. Um, Real quick, I want to hit on, so two Mondays ago, yeah, I think, yeah, so two weeks ago on Monday, I talked about Chance the Rapper going on the Joe Budden podcast, and I think this is partly the reason why I last last week made me self-conscious. I have no business talking about this, other than the fact that I'm a huge Chance the Rapper fan, and, you know, I, I I keep up with, like, kind of the goings on of hip hop culture, um, just because I'm a fan. But man, I just like the ultimate point that I made was I'm so tired of people just like writing off optimistic people as just like corny, 
you know, and I get it. Like I, I read sort of those inspirational, like YouTube CEOs and all their bullshit. And I think like, man, this is so cheesy. Like you're clearly just saying this to get likes or whatever, to make people feel good or whatever it is. And obviously that's corny, you know, but like, I think there are legitimately people out there, Chance the Rapper being one of them that are doing good for their city, doing good for others, raising money, um, donating uh, now, Chance, like over $2 million um, to, you know, causes of mental health, child services, public education, just stuff that like the city of Chicago really needs. And so often I hear people just like write him off as corny, you know, as if he's like trying to do that just to be like a do-gooder. And it's, and that's like super frustrating to me. And I'm happy that I saw a ton of feedback from that podcast that everyone was like, oh man, like I totally see Chance the Rapper in a new light. Like he's actually legit. And I think even Joe and, and the rest of his crew said the same thing, but I'm just like, man, like why, why not give him the benefit of the doubt? You know, like why are we so quick to write off people as corny? I think there are people that actually want to do good for others out there. And I don't know, that's just me ranting. Um, and you know, shout out to chance. Cause I think he, he handled that well and, uh, and always kind of handles himself well. So, uh, I, Oh, I also wrote that there's like T last, well, last time there was like T minus 20 days until NaNoWriMo, which is the acronym for national novel writing month. Today is the 22nd. Oh, damn, there are eight days until National Novel Writing Month. So in November, there's this thing called National Novel Writing Month where people from all over the world basically team, not necessarily team up, but there's a community of people trying to write a novel in a month. And there's certain deadlines and certain um, word counts that you're trying to hit each day, certain quotas that actually will help you like write a novel. And I tried it. I've tried it. Well, I tried it the first time, I think maybe like 2014, 2013, something like that. And it was like crazy, crazy hard. And I, I, I didn't keep up with it. I failed miserably. And then in 2014, I wrote the first ever Instagram novel, which was like a photo novel basically. And that was a lot more short form and way doable and not nearly like the length of a novel, but it did help give me consistency each day in actually writing. And uh, I've been really wanting to attempt it again um, now actually with some intention because I have a book that I want to write and it's not actually a novel. I want to write a book kind of like um, what I'm doing right now for the artist about <clears throat> just the process and creativity and patience and discipline and all of those things that I've learned over you know my careers as a touring musician as a writer as a photographer and director now creative director um there're just so many principles that i've learned that i think are helpful for anyone trying to be a freelance creative a freelance artist and i want to just kind of write those down so that's going to be my goal for november fingers crossed it's going to be tough but i'm actually super stoked about it but i haven't been writing in a while so i'm a little i imagine i'm a little uh, rusty, but we'll give it a shot. Um, oh, so, and then like two weeks ago on a, on last, not last Friday, but the Friday before I didn't post a morning thought, which is the first time in a while during the week that I haven't done that. And I was just exhausted, man. I just like there. So I normally get up at five and work out at five 30. Um, just because if you've been listening to the podcast, you know, that's something that I really enjoy. But there, are, sometimes there are days where I'm just like, I just wake up and I am dragging. And it was one of those days I was exhausted. My brain was mush. I was just having like no thoughts. And it kind of made me think about later, like there is this balance of hustle and knowing, like knowing when to hustle and bust your ass and also knowing when to like forgive yourself and make allowances for just like, not hustling. Like sometimes you need rest. And it's interesting because I feel like people are super quick to give themselves a rest. Like that's not, that's not new to anyone. I think we've entered like into this, this cultural phase of like glorifying self-care and, and don't get me wrong, self-care should be glorified. Like that's a good thing. However, I think a lot of people take it to the extreme and, like self-care becomes 
like a lack of a lack of like discipline and a lack of like hustle and like willingness to work hard and that like that pisses me off and i and that's like something that i don't want to see in myself and so i think there's a balance between like knowing when if you're ambitious to really like push yourself to work hard and then also knowing when like hey there are limits you can't always operate at 110 percent you will die and so um that's just a, a quick thought that I have and just know where you fall. Like, and, and also know if you tend to lean one way or the other, like if you tend to push yourself way too hard, which I think are, are fewer and fewer people these days, but, um, whether you tend to like just hustle all the time and you're always exhausted or you tend just to lean towards like self care and like, Oh, it's all good. I'll do it tomorrow. Like go have a fancy lunch and like relax, you know, like, not that you shouldn't do that every now and then, but if you do that all the time, you broke. Um, you're not you're not going to make any money, and you're not going to create the things that you want to create. So, um, I just highly recommend that you just kind of assess and become self aware on that topic. So last week I posted. I think it was last Monday. Let me pull it up. I posted on multiple having like multiple disciplines. So. The thought was, I, I talk frequently about focusing your voice as an artist. It makes your work stronger. It makes it more marketable. Um, but just because you're focused in one discipline and because your voice is focused doesn't mean you can't have multiple disciplines, like whether that's photography or graphic design or, you know, synth or and entrepreneurship. Like, I think it actually makes you potentially a more successful creative and a more successful artist to have m- like multidisciplinary experience. Um, and a lot of times that just means like be being open to opportunities outside of your discipline uh, and not getting bogged down in how you label yourself. Like if you think of yourself as a photographer, don't turn down opportunities to do other things that you're passionate about or, or talented in just because they are outside of the label of photographer. Um, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately because in addition to doing photography, I mean, I've always sort of been multidisciplinary combining words with photos or, or writing with video or music, even songwriting. Um, but lately the multidisciplines that I've really been involved in are photography and, and motion, and then also creative direction for a brand that, uh, I'm launching and starting with a partner, which I'll talk more about another time, but that's really what I've been, been working on. So that involves a lot of design, a lot of overarching kind of creative direction in terms of like voice and style and that sort of thing and branding. And that's been really fun for me. And I think it makes my work as a photographer better and vice versa. I get to use my, my photography and my, um, skills in, in shooting video for, for this creative direction as well. So, um, I don't know. That's just, uh, that's my thought. I also think that, and I mentioned this when I, when I talked about becoming a full-time photographer, I also think that it opens you up to potentially having more, um, opportunities to make money, which as a freelance photographer or freelance artist in general is always a good thing. Um, I think that if you put yourself in one box, those opportunities become more limited. And if you're a creative that has your hands in multiple um, disciplines or genres, there there will be far more uh, opportunities for you. And hopefully you can uh, provide more value and make more money that way. Okay, positive vibes only. All right, I'm right, I'm guilty of this. I think we're all guilty of this, of being like, Yo, Instagram, positive vibes only, you know, when you're feeling good or like good vibes only. But I had a morning thought that was basically like Instagram is positive vibes only, but life is not like life is the opposite. Um, And so I think when we mistake Instagram for life, which I think is obviously none of us are thinking it's life, but like we are subconsciously equating what we see on Instagram as reality. And I think that that is a huge it's a huge reason for the depression and anxiety and overall like mental 
um, detriment that Instagram is causing for a lot of people, like mental health uh, wellness detriment. And and I think the solution to that is just just like when you when you're up and when you're positive and when you're happy, you know it's good vibes on good vibes only. But when you're you're down or like you you took some L's like I did last week. Um, and you get on Instagram and you see other people that are winning and doing cool stuff that you want to do or, or just, you know, in cool places or whatever it is, relaxing on vacation. Like it's super easy to equate that with that's their real life. Like that's who that's their 24 seven. And I guarantee you that they just as frequently as you, if not more so have the, the down moments, take the L's, um, you know, And just as often as you do, sorry, I, 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 my brain froze for a second, but, um, I think like, just keep that in mind, like keep in mind that we're all going through similar ups and downs. And when you see Instagram, nobody's posting their downs. No downs. Don't get likes. No one wants to see your downs on Instagram. And so no one wants to see your L's. So just keep in mind, you're only seeing the good stuff. You're only seeing the wins on Instagram. And uh, I think you'll be a little more happy. Like you'll be happier having that perspective if you're not feeling like super, super happy or stoked uh, or successful at the moment, you know? Um, All right, cool. So I want to get into some questions, which were some really, really good ones. Um, the The first one was how I come up with morning thoughts. I I think it's funny. I think a lot of people think that I'm just like keeping a like keeping a log of things to, to write every morning. But honestly, like ninety five percent of the time, I'm just literally driving to go work out and it's the stuff that's going through my head like that's kind of ruminating in my mind at the time you know i think a lot about the craft and creation and the process and so uh and i'm also like i'm reading a lot of stuff i'm reading a lot of articles i'm reading a lot of um inspirational stuff from like seth godin every morning or whatever it is and that always kind of gets me gets me thinking and gets the wheels turning so um yeah, I mean, it's honestly just kind of what I'm thinking of on the spot, which is why it's generally pretty random. Um, okay, so let's get into the the real good stuff, the stuff that you guys probably wanted to hear about. And uh, the first one is, how do I decide on my rate, my my agents, my rates, and should I have an agent? Well, let's take those one at a time. So, rates are that's a really interesting concept. I think that the the concept of rates come from the, the, well, let me back up. So there's this idea of in portrait and wedding photography, there's this idea of like a rate and that rate is generally all encompassing. It's like, okay, here's what it costs for me to shoot your wedding, or here's what it costs to do a senior portrait session or a two hour portrait session with two looks and 10 edited images or whatever. Like that's my rates. $400 or whatever it may be. Now that's not really how it works in advertising or in commercial work. Um, There are rates, there are day rates, but on top of day rates, there are production costs and team costs and catering and licensing and location rental and like all that stuff that go in there. So there's no way for me to tell you like, here's what rates are. Um, hear like the common accepted numbers for where you are in your career. It's honestly different from market to market, from project to project, production to production, city to city as well. Like things are going to be more expensive in New York. The rates are higher than they are in Austin. But that's not to say there aren't generally accepted rates for for like day rates and that sort of thing. So Um, I highly recommend you, you kind of look into, okay, what are market rates for a day rate? Maybe it's like for a commercial project, it's $5,000 or maybe it's $10,000 because you are, you know, super experienced and you're doing super technical work and you're the only one that can do it, you know, or you're shooting an integrated campaign or whatever it may be. Um, like there are a lot of factors that go into it. Most often, 99% of the time, the biggest factor is just budget. Like, what do they have to work with? 
And how can you fit the production costs um, into the budget with your rate? So a lot of times rate is just flexible and you just have to take it on a case by case budget, uh, budget basis, budget basis. Yeah. Um, my brain is not operating at 100%, but guys, we're all in this together. So should you have an agent? So that's a really good question as well. Here's the thing about agents. Most people think that when they get an agent, the agent's going to bring in tons of work and they're just going to be killing it because most of the people at the top, the top 1% of photographers doing the top 1% of work in fashion, fitness, advertising, whatever, all have agents. Now, that's a misconception because basically it's the photographer bringing in the work and the agent is helping them handle that work, whether it's um, working on treatments or bidding on projects or um, invoicing clients or whatever it may be. They're handling a lot of the logistics stuff so that the photographer can handle a lot more of the production and creative stuff. Um, and that's why it's good to have an agent. However, I'll also tell you, and I've heard this from John Keely and from a bunch of other people, that having an agent is very much like being in a married relationship. Um, there will be times, a lot of times frequently, where you are butting heads with your agent, that you're disagreeing, that you guys are fighting, and at the end of the day, you have to trust them and they have to trust you and you have to like them even though you are often fighting about you know, what the right next step is or whether or not you should take a job or whatever it may be. And so just be warned that having an agent is not always as glamorous as it might seem. Also, a word to the wise, they're handling money for you. And prior to having an agent, I've, I've always been a super like trusting person. And I've I, I, I don't really think about like the nickel and nickels and dimes of like budgeting and, and money and that sort of thing. Um, the reason I left my previous agent was because they took money from me and that was, um, almost a year ago now. And I haven't seen any money back and, um, I just want to be real honest with you guys that like make sure you do your due diligence that, that the person that you sign with that is handling your money is a trustworthy person that has good references, that has good, hopefully a good history of character and that sort of thing because you could find yourself in a situation where um, you get taken advantage of, which I don't want to happen to you. So that's serious moment with Philip Etzel. Uh, and back to um, hopefully more... Uh, um, helpful information. But um, yeah, all that to say, like, don't rush into having an agent, shop around. And when you're ready for it, you'll know you're ready for it. All right, Todd asked, licensing terms, how do you decide on licensing limits, licensing terms? Are they a necessary evil? So first and foremost, I definitely don't call them a necessary evil. Like licensing is is a good thing and it's meant to protect your creativity, to protect your, your talent and your craft as a photographer. And so many younger photographers don't understand what licensing is and they end up undercutting other photographers that do and budgets as a whole across the entire market begin to shrink because younger photographers aren't charging licensing fees and you know clients think that they can get away with like shrinking smaller budgets. So. I really want to take a second to talk about that. And to do that, I'm going to draw a graph. So this is going to be a super simplification of licensing. I don't think that there's necessarily like a, a hard and fast rule on like what licensing is, but this is kind of how I think about it. So for you guys listening to the podcast, I'm creating just a normal graph and um, like an XY graph with a line that just goes up. So at the bottom left, where the X, Y axes meet, um, it's at zero. And then in the top right, the line just goes up um, at the highest point. So, okay, so on the, uh, I don't, God, I'm, I never did like like math or, or well, I did math, but I never like got very super far into that. 
So I don't know which axis is the, is the up and down one, but on that one, I'm gonna put at the top, I'm gonna put creativity. I'll put creativity and at the bottom, I'm gonna put, um, let's just put like craftsman. Okay, so looks like that. And then on the left to right axis, I'm gonna put, um, well, so the left, that, that axis is gonna be value, but I'm basically gonna determine value by like number of eyeballs. So at the bottom corner, bottom left corner, let's call that 100 eyeballs, eyes. This is like, I know this is silly, but this is how we're doing it. And then the top right, we're gonna call that 100, thousand so 100k eyes this is basically just how i'm determining value so okay so first and foremost let's take this axis on like creativity versus craftsman and what i mean by that so at the bottom you have basically jobs that are like you're being hired as a craftsman it's like the person that's hiring you doesn't know how to take a photograph but they need a very specific type of photograph that doesn't require any sort of creativity from you um, but it requires technical skill. So maybe that's like, uh, you know, a headshot on a white seamless, like they need it for their LinkedIn profile. There's really not a lot that you can do there to be creative. It is what it is, but you know, you need lighting and you need a good camera, et cetera. And at the very top, let's say that's like an ad campaign and you're shooting a um, a commercial and you need to direct and you have to come up with the concept for this ad campaign. And you also have to come up with, you know, how you want to shoot it and what the angles are going to be and what the shot list is and what the storyboard is and the script and, you know, how you're going to produce it, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that is like at the top of creativity. So the, the gap here between being a craftsman and, and having creativity is like one you're being hired is basically like a service person, a craftsman. Like you're, you're basically being hired as like a plumber. You're hired for a job. It's a very technical job. On the other one, you're being hired as an artist. And that's like your creativity, something that you bring to the table that's different than what somebody else brings to the table. Like no two artists are going to bring the same idea, but if you're a craftsman and you're two electricians, you guys are probably going to solve the problem the exact same way. Okay. And then on this bottom, the left to right axis, we have 100 eyes versus 100,000 eyes. So 100 eyes, let's say like someone hires you to take a photo and it's going on their Instagram and they have 100 followers. You know, maybe 100 people see it, probably not, maybe 50 people see it. Um, but that creates like, it creates value for them, but like the value only goes so far. It's likely that if they only have a hundred or 500 or a thousand followers, like they're probably like a local business and you know, the value is, is, um, is not like super high. Um, okay. Let's say on this other end of the spectrum, a hundred thousand eyes, you are, it's that television commercial and it's being seen by, okay. So maybe that's like a million people, you know, maybe a million people or a hundred thousand people are seeing it on a billboard in times square. That's massive value for the brand because so many people are seeing that thing that you created, that photo that you took, that video that you shot, whatever it is, that's massive value. And it can be anything from, you know, either of those examples to like, maybe they're going to print your image on the shoe box that goes out to every order or goes out on every order for the next year, like your photos on the shoe box. Like that's massive value. Tons of people are going to see that, you know? Um, and then back to the other, other end of the spectrum on the hundred eyes or whatever, like maybe they're printing it on a brochure or a flyer that's being used internally for the office and only the people that work at the office are going to see it. Like that's not a huge amount of value necessarily. So, if we look at the cross section at the bottom here, it's like, okay, maybe like, so a good example of this is like, maybe you're shooting headshots for um, a, a smaller company and it's only going to be shown internally, you know, on the company newsletter. Like that's probably going to be a low licensing or no licensing fee because to be honest, like it's not being seen by that many people. They're hiring you to do a, the job of a craftsman and the value there is pretty low. 
Uh, I mean, maybe if it's an office that is going to use these images for the next like five years, you can charge licensing for that. But most likely, um, that's like a almost like a no licensing fee type thing. And then up at the top, let's just say like, okay, you get hired for uh, an Instagram campaign for uh, for I don't know Gap or somebody with like a hundred thousand. Um, like, or sorry, a million followers on Instagram. Like that could be, that could be, actually I should probably put that in the middle. Let's put IG in the middle. Okay, because like, even though they have a million followers, that photo is only gonna be seen for, I don't know, 24 hours, a week. Maybe if somebody goes back and looks through their feed, they'll see it every now and then. But like, that's only so much value. Okay, and then let's go to like a TV commercial or something that's gonna live on YouTube, you know? or like a massive print or ad campaign. That's major eyeballs, that's major value. Not to mention, it is uh, like massive creativity on your part. And that's gonna mean that like you need to protect your creativity. So this is why you charge for licensing in the first place, is because like you're charging your day rate for basically your ability to execute your job as a craftsman and sometimes that day rates higher but you're charging your licensing to protect your creative uh artistic output and like somebody can hire you to shoot images um and they get to you know they might get to keep those images but they don't get to keep your creativity they don't get to keep your artistic output that you put into this project but they can license that from you. And so that's kind of the way that I think about licensing. And I know that that's kind of a tough concept. I'll put this one up like one more time. Maybe I'll get a good thumbnail out of this or something. I don't know. Um, yeah. But uh, that's kind of how I think about licensing. Hopefully that helps. If you have more questions, um, ask them in the comments below. Shoot me a DM on Instagram. I'm at Etzel. Um, and let me know if I need to explain that a little more in depth. Um, okay, that was a lot. Okay, finally, I'll just touch on this real quick. So um, I wrote a post not too long ago, probably about a year ago, about editing, retouching on my iPad. There's an app called Affinity Photo. It's basically Photoshop. And and by when I say basically, like it'll literally do everything Photoshop does. It'll do like frequency separation, like actual crazy um, in-depth, nerdy stuff that you can do in Photoshop, it'll do that. And you can do that on the iPad and you can retouch on the screen, which is super nice because it prevents not needing a like a Wacom tablet or whatever. And uh, I thought for a long time that was gonna be a really great solution for me. But, and, and especially now that Photoshop just last week uh, or Adobe just announced last week that Photoshop for the iPad is coming soon. And that will allow you to do, I guess, everything you can do in Photoshop on your desktop or, or computer on the iPad. So I think a lot of people are having this question. However, it's just not, it's a super slow process, a super slow experience. Not only is the screen smaller, I have a, the 10 inch iPad Pro, but even with that, just operating without a keyboard, operating with only a pencil just takes a lot longer. Um, I think if you're doing pretty minimal edits, like in Lightroom, editing on your iPad is is great. You can edit RAWs, but I think doing actual like skin retouching, that just gets really tedious. It's totally doable and a, and a really pretty decent mobile solution. Um, if you're like on the go or on a plane or whatever, and that's how I've kind of used it. But as like a everyday workplace solution, it's not, it's just, it's super slow, it's not a great experience, and it's kind of frustrating. Sometimes the app even crashes every now and then. And so, I don't know, my 27 inch iMac, which I edit on with a Wacom tablet has ruined me for even like, even 15 inch um, like MacBook Pros, which, uh, which I have and I, I use that um, when I'm traveling occasionally. However, um, it's a good mobile solution. So that's my thought on that. I appreciate you guys listening. We're at, oh, we're at 52 minutes, dang. I think that was like 52, minutes of good helpful information unlike last week which was just kind of me ranting so hopefully you guys dug that um if that licensing bit was really helpful for you and you learned something if the social media bit was helpful and you learned something like please rate this on itunes and podcasts or on spot uh, can you rate things on spotify i don't know but rate it there anyway um 
and give it a thumbs up on YouTube and just tell people about it. Like, I think I just want this to be a, a resource and I've, I've tried to do this a lot on YouTube and on Instagram and whatever, just like give people good information. And I think that I've had some success with that, but a lot of times it just took too much time and was too much production value, et cetera. And this feels like a really good platform for me to just like to rant, but also give you guys good information and not take up an entire day of my time. So would love for you guys to share this. Please um, um, let people know about it and like and subscribe, I guess, on YouTube. And uh, I'll see you guys next week. Cheers. Cheers.